Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, good evening to all of those in our time zones. And if anyone is with us from Europe or China, you know, good morning. I'm glad you could join us today or this morning, I guess. It's this morning. That's right. Uh, tonight, we have Linda Thomas Fowler, who is going to give us some really cool stuff about Nina. Uh, it's become a really popular program and free, of course and very capable and we're going to learn a little bit more about Nina and before that we got a couple things to cover I'm not going to bring up the calendar but just for everyone that doesn't know it that we don't have a show next week because it's the annual eclipse and whether you're in the path of, of I guess it's not totality but you know the little ring around the sun annularity annularity I, I don't know if I've heard that word it's oh cool or annularity, not totality. Uh, congratulations. Those of us that are not, there's still going to be a very wide path where the moon is going to partially obscure. And if you take a bunch of images, they can really come out nice and you can make some composite images, which I think you'd all appreciate. So no show next week. Uh, the week after, Terry Mann's going to talk to us about imaging the aurora. She's going to give us a little elevator pitch on that presentation in a moment. And after that, Greg Cricklaw is going to optimize your imaging capture, which we all need to do. And then after that, Craig Stocks and then Adam Block. And then we have some open uh, dates. So those of you who have some really cool ideas on astrophotography and would like to present here, just go to our site, theastroimagingchannel.org, uh, send us a note, and someone will get in touch with you and come up with a good subject. We can put you on the schedule. And with that brief introduction, let me get back to here. Terry is going to give us, Terry Mann, not Terry Robeson. <laughs> Terry Mann's going to give us a kind of an elevator pitch on what she's going to present in two weeks. So, Terry, go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Well, you guys have probably all noticed the sun has been extremely active and it's really good to see sunspots. Maybe we'll even have them for the eclipse. So I'm going to talk about the aurora because I'm hoping we get more down this way or more in the northern tier of the U.S. So um, I want to talk about how to image it, um, maybe places to see, what I've learned imaging. And I have learned a lot about imaging the aurora here lately. Um, because I didn't know anything when I started out either. So this will be for beginners, advanced, anybody along the way. I, I think we're all kind of beginners in Aurora, and I think we all have it on our astrophotography bucket list to get the Aurora. Unfortunately, I live in a place where, you know, unless the sun explodes, I don't think we're going to be <laughs> seeing an Aurora. But I'm always hopeful, and I always check the little map, and if it comes our way, I one day I might go up north and try to do it, in which case I'll learn from your presentation, Terry. And with that, Linda, can we turn it over to you? Are you ready to tell us more about Nina? Sure thing. Thanks, Eric. All right. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about a completely autonomous sequence that's put together using, using Nina and a plugin for Nina called Target Scheduler. So in 2020, I was invited to participate in two remote observatories, one at SRO in California and the other one in Texas. And this introduced me to the joys and frustrations of remote imaging, and unlike the picture there where I'm setting up in my backyard. And this started me on a journey that directly led to this presentation. So enough about me, let's talk about you. And basically, uh, I'm not assuming that you're an expert on Nina. Being familiar is definitely helpful, but at least some basic familiar, familiarity with sequencing in, in one of the image acquisition programs is pretty much assumed. So why do this? We had a working sequence and a procedure for how to update that sequence to balance out exposures and to add new targets, and it worked. And it worked pretty well, but it was somewhat fiddly. 
while it wasn't exactly error prone, it was a place to introduce mistakes. And so it required somebody, usually me, to check the weather at the remote site, decide if it was worth trying to image, start the sequence each evening, and then ensure things were shut down each morning. And this was all very exciting in the beginning. I was controlling something far away and getting great data. But you know, any repetitive task becomes less interesting over time. And as a programmer, I kind of wanted to see if there was more automation possible. So that's where we were starting from. We had basically automation for a night. Uh, we could handle safety, you know, stopping imaging when the weather was bad. And we had made some initial steps at automating power management, but that's where we were in the beginning. So these are the things that we figured out that we needed to handle. My goal was to automate as much as we could, but that automation couldn't come at the cost of safety. I was being entrusted with a lot of very expensive equipment and I didn't wanna be the cause of a peer crash. Thankfully, both observatories had high roofs and the roof was not under my control. So I didn't need to worry about when the roof opened or closed or whether the scope was in a safe position for it to close. Much of our safety with respect to the pier comes from APCC, the Astrophysics Command Center, which controls the mount. But we do everything we can to keep the telescope from tracking when it isn't actively engaged in imaging. Generally, that means returning to the park position when we're not doing anything. So back in May, 2022, Roland Archer did a presentation here on the Astro Imaging Channel on a Voyager update that would do similar automation to what I was envisioning, but at least in the first release, it wouldn't go as far as I wanted. It's possible that it's gone further than that now though, but Nina's extensibility and the rapid development cycles of the open source community had me hoping that someone would take up that challenge, and that person turned out to be Tom Palmer. Even in the initial releases of Tom's target scheduler plugin, it was very capable. Uh, one of my teammates at SRO, Chris Kagey, was a very early adopter of, of this at home, and Tom invited him and later me into his Discord chat to provide feedback. Through Tom's amazing efforts, the plugin has continued to evolve over time. So there is some required equipment that we or that we need for this. Aside from all the normal imaging stuff, we use a digital logger's web power switch to control AC power to the devices. I knew that I could write a script to actually control those switches from a Windows script, but it turns out there was an ASCOM driver out there that eliminated the need. And since the roof was not under our control, I decided to use the roof as an open closed status, as the, excuse me, use the roof's open closed status as part of our safety criteria. We use the ASCOM safety monitor hub with two drivers. The generic file safety monitor is used to monitor the roof status file and it returns unsafe if the roof is closed. We combine that with the environment safety monitor, which applies basic rules using another observing conditions driver to evaluate whether it's safe to image. So if it's too cloudy, if it's wet outside, if the humidity is too high, if it's too windy, we return unsafe. So if either of those drivers return unsafe to the hub, then we consider it unsafe. And then finally, we have an automatic flat, automatic flat device. And while you can do sky flats, and in Nina 3, you can do automated sky flats now, it's certainly a lot easier to do them with a flat panel. So in addition to Nina, there's a few plugins that we need to make this work. Core Nina functionality provides most of what we need, but there are a few things that actually turn out to be useful. Target scheduler, which does the lion's share of the work for us in terms of choosing targets and then executing them. There's a plugin called Sequencer Power Ups, which we use for safety instructions and for constants. There's a connector plugin, which we use to automate connecting and disconnecting to equipment. And then there's a plugin called Ground Station that we use for notification. So any notification plugin would, would actually work. 
Then there are a few optional plugins. They're not needed to make this sequence work, but they can help either in setting up some things that you're then later going to use in the sequence or that Nina can use at runtime. One of those is uh, the first two are actually setup plugins. Filter offset calculator will help you determine your filter offsets if you're going to use those instead of focusing through your filters. And then Horizon Creator will create a Horizon file that Nina can then use to decide whether it can get to a target or not. Uh, the last two are operational plugins. Hocus Focus can replace Nina's built-in autofocus routines, and it does a great job for us. And then Smart Meridian Flip can actually maximize your imaging time near the meridian. You need to give it a file which says how far past the meridian you can go in any particular declination, and it'll uh, actually delay its flip based on what declination you're at. So with all that out of the way, let's start talking about the sequence. This is uh, the general overview of the sequence, and we'll refer back to this at various points so we don't lose our place. Nina uses containers to group instructions that are related. Containers that don't have loop conditions get executed only once, while containers with loop conditions execute as long as those loop conditions remain true. So in this sequence, we have two containers that have loop conditions, that loop foreverish container that's at the outside and the night loop container. There's actually another subcontainer inside a night loop that has a loop condition as well, but we'll get to that later. So this outermost container doesn't really do much. Uh, and we structured our sequence this way to make it easier to understand so that when we went back and looked at it later, if something breaks, it's easier to understand what parts are responsible for which functions. Here, this loop foreverish container just is really a container for all the other containers. It has one loop condition that loops while active projects remain. So when target scheduler says, as long as target scheduler says, I have projects which are active, this loop will stay active. And that could last weeks, months, theoretically years. The other thing we do in this is set some constants. And we're going to use these constants later to decide whether some optional behavior happens. The first of those nested power or nested containers is the power on container. This is the container that's responsible for turning on equipment and basically getting ready to image. There's one instruction in here, start APCC, that's part of a plugin I didn't mention. It's part of the Astrophysics Tools plugin, and we just use it to start the APCC program for us. If that didn't exist, we could have done it in a Windows batch file, but I like doing it this way because it made it obvious what it was doing. There are two other auxiliary programs that actually get used as part of our sequence. One that pretty much everybody will be using, which is PHD, and Nina will start that for us automatically when we connect to PHD. The other one's called PWI3, and it's specific to the plane wave focuser that we use on that system. And so it starts automatically when we connect to the ASCOM driver. One of the things that you'll notice is that as soon as we connect to all the equipment, we park the scope. Now, we park it all, or not park it, but when APCC connects to the scope and initializes it, we have it set the scope to not track. Technically, it's unparked, but not tracking. But we try to use a belt and suspenders approach. If either of these fail, or if one of them fails, then hopefully the other one will take care of things. In practice, that's not going to happen, but that's been our approach to doing things. So now we're back at that top level. We finished with power on. We're going to go into this broadband flats container. This thing's responsible for actually getting broadband flats um, before nautical dusk. And we've timed it so that we finish our flats before we get to nautical dusk because some people in the shared observatory might be starting to image at nautical dusk, so we don't want to impact their imaging. But we don't do this every night. That constant that we set up at the top, if we set that to one, 
then we do this. If we don't set it to one, if it's set to zero, then we don't do this. One of the things you'll notice here is this send HTTP request. You'll see these scattered all through here. In this case, we're using this to notify a Discord webhook so that we can get real-time notifications in our team Discord chat about what the sequence is doing. And again, we park the scope because that gets it pointed at the flat panel. It should already be parked, but one of the things we decided was that each container is going to be responsible as much as it can be to ensure that the conditions it needs to execute properly are satisfied. So now that we're done with the broadband flats, we're actually ready to start imaging for the night, and we're going to go into the night loop. Here's where really all the logic about imaging for the night happens. And when we go into night loop, again, it doesn't look all that complicated. We have two loop conditions. One's a target scheduler condition that says, while there are targets remaining tonight, we stay in this loop. If there are no more targets tonight, then we exit the loop. The other one loops until five minutes past nautical dawn. And we end up needing both of these because of the way we're handling safety conditions. And I'll get into that in more detail later. The reason that we chose five minutes past nautical dawn is just to ensure that any final notifications that might come from target scheduler actually get to us. We don't want them to get interrupted before they can come out. Linda? Yeah. Uh, it, it may be obvious to everyone, but could you just give me a, give us a brief explanation of the function of the looping? I think I know the answer, but not it might not be obvious to everyone. Yeah, so if a, if a container doesn't have a loop condition, it just runs through it once. But if it has a loop condition, um, then it's going to evaluate each one of those loop conditions. And that's not necessarily an evaluate at the top of the loop sort of thing like it would be in a programming language. It's basically a point at which it defines an interrupt condition. So, for example, nautical dawn could happen at any time, uh, that nautical dawn plus five minutes. When it happens, it'll interrupt the running sequence and exit this container. And there's a lot of different kinds of loop conditions. And we'll see a couple of them down below. Does that answer your question, Eric? Uh, isn't it also used to continue on with your exposures? And if you have 20 exposures, it keeps looping until it's satisfied that condition. One of the loop conditions could be a simple iteration count. So you could say loop through this 20 times. Yeah. So you, you could definitely use it that way. Okay. Thank you. So we have two containers in here. Conditions are safe and check for unsafe conditions. That conditions are safe container is where all the work's going to happen. And check for unsafe conditions is where we're going to do our safety handling. So this fairly complicated looking thing is actually much simpler than it looks. Um, the big thing that's taking up a lot of space here is the target scheduler instruction. We're going to come to that in another slide. But here's the container where we basically put a lot of our a logic for what's going to happen inside conditions are safe. So you'll see three triggers autofocus after temperature change, restore guiding, and smart meridian flip. These triggers apply to this container and any container nested inside of it. And technically, target scheduler is a container itself. And so anything from here inside, these triggers will apply. So periodically, uh, Nina will check or give control to these instructions to check to see if they should interrupt the loop and then take control. But when that trigger finishes, it goes back to what it was doing. The loop condition here is loop while safe. So we'll stay in this loop as long as our safety handler is saying that it's safe. If it stops becoming safe, and that could happen in at any point, then we'll exit the container immediately. The first thing we do here is unpark the scope and set the tracking to stopped. Target scheduler would probably be kind enough to unpark the scope for us, but we're just going to be explicit here and make sure that things are in a good state for it. Then we send our notification to Discord, and then we call target scheduler itself. 
Don't worry too much about that yet. We're going to come to that in the next slide. Then you'll see three instructions at the end, an annotate, a park scope, and a, and a notification. We actually should never get to these because we should always exit this loop because of one of these loop conditions. Either the loop while safe here fails or one of the loop conditions in the night loop that we're contained in should fail. And so we should never get to these bottom instructions because target. we should always get interrupted while we're in the target scheduler. But if we do, if something fails, then we're going to park the scope and then send a notification that we, we got here. We didn't expect to, but we did. Uh, so that's not necessarily a, a reason to cause us to abort the sequence, but it's something we don't expect to happen. Now we come to the target scheduler itself. And here's where, if we've got a nice clear night, where we're going to spend, spend the entire night. And you'll see here in the center, there's basically a log of what target scheduler is doing. Um, you can look at that in real time to see what's going on, but generally we're asleep when this thing's going, so we can look at it after the fact. Then down here at the bottom, you'll see these things like triggers, before wait, after wait, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. These places are basically buckets where we can put instructions that are going to happen at defined points in the target scheduler workflow. So the first one is the triggers. And this is just like a normal Nina trigger. Uh, and there's one trigger that needs to actually be in the container that the target is defined in, and that's center after drift. And if you're not using this, you don't need to worry about triggers here. You can put them in the enclosing container. Tom, the uh, plugin author, actually recommends that you put most of your triggers in the surrounding container because he thinks the user interface is cleaner that way. But you could put them here as well. Then we come to this thing that you've likely never seen before because it doesn't exist in another plugin, which is the before wait. And so if Nina doesn't, or excuse me, if target scheduler doesn't have a target, then it goes into a wait mode. And before it starts waiting, it calls these before wait instructions. In our case, we send a notification and then we park the scope. Then target scheduler does its waiting. When it's done waiting, it calls these after wait instructions. And here we unpark the scope again, stop the tracking. And then our camera does a strange thing where if it's been idle for a very long time, then the first exposure after it seems to be bad. Um, so in our case, we just take a dummy exposure to flush out that bad frame so that when Nina goes to do a plate solve, it'll be able to. It's something that people with CMOS cameras probably aren't gonna have to worry about. Now, when Nina has a target, it's going to slew and center, and if you have a rotator, rotate and get you all plate solved and set up. Once it's done that, it's going to be called this before new target set of instructions. In our case, we do a notification, and then we run an autofocus. Um, we actually use autofocus on temperature change, and we're using filter offsets. So we don't really have a problem with autofocus drifting or with focus drifting out of the autofocus set point. Um, but just in case, this should get us back on track. We can actually do an autofocus run fairly quickly, so we don't lose much time doing this. After target scheduler has run through all the instructions that you have set up for doing a target, it calls after new target. We don't have anything to do here. We just do a notification so that the Discord people know that it's done with this target. And that covers the conditions our safe loop. Now we come to the check for unsafe conditions loop, or not loop, but container. Um, there are actually two ways that we could get here. One way is if conditions became unsafe and we 
exited the conditions or safe container. But the other way we could get here is just we had a great night of imaging and everything ran well. Uh, we exited conditions are safe because we got to nautical dawn. And in that case, we still fall through to this check for unsafe conditions. So this is what happens in here. We use an if statement, which comes from the sequencer power-ups plugins to say if conditions are unsafe. If they are, we park the scope, we notify Discord about the unsafe conditions, and then we do some checking. And if we've set this constant get unsafe darks to be one, then we actually try to grab darks. And we'll get into the details of that on the next slide. If that constant isn't set, then we just wait until it's safe. And we'll wait there until either it's safe or we get to nautical dawn from the enclosing loop. So now next, we're going to go inside this grab darks while unsafe container that's inside of this section. And here's the other loop condition that we have. And we're going to stay in this, you know, if the get unsafe darks was set, we're going to stay in this in this container as long as conditions remain unsafe. And then we're just going to go through and get darks. Now we can do this on our camera because it has a shutter. And if the roof is closed at the observatory, which generally it will be when conditions are unsafe, then we can actually get decent darks. And that actually covers all the complexity of the night loop. So uh, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, who's our question person who's doing that? I am, Eric. Uh, so we have, we have one question from Sam. Um, do the safety monitor plugins run independent of a thread? It doesn't rely on Nina being run. Also, if Nina crashes and you, or you're asleep, uh, would the observatory close? No. Uh, if Nina crashes, then anything that happens in this sequence isn't going to happen. In our case, that's not an issue because the roof's not under our control. Um, but yeah, if if uh, I, I w if I was controlling the roof, I'd want some external control that would also be closing the roof in the case of bad weather, independently of Nina. What I do in my observatory is I do have a cloud sensor weather station, which actually does trip a physical relay, which is connected to the dome. So if the uh, computer crashes, it doesn't matter. Um, the weather station will trick or a relay, it will close the dome automatically. If it loses con connectivity with the computer, it is also set up with its own hardware watchdog on the dome to close itself. So part of your equipment safety would be having other methods of monitoring state. Agreed. Not, yeah, not purely relying to one thing. I do have a question. Can you yeah. create your own interrupts or actions? Like say there's a weather event, you could have a whole bunch of actions you would like to queue up. Um, if I understand your question, then potentially, um, can you describe what you what you mean in a little more detail? Um, clouds come over. When that happens, uh, I'd like to perhaps home the dome, then maybe close the dome, park. Followed by you know, follow by parking the scope or whatever actions I want to do, or yeah. I, could check, I could check the status of something. Like if if it actually had a, an error with the shutter, could you retry again? So um, let me hold that last question for a bit. But in terms of let me back up here, um, that's basically what we're doing here. We're looking for uh, you know we. We were told things were unsafe. We're actually validating that things are unsafe here and then continuing. Now, this actually, for people that are familiar with Nina and who've used the sequencer power ups, might seem an awkward way to do things. There is a sequencer power ups instruction, a trigger called when becomes unsafe, and it has its own instruction bucket like this that you could put things into. But when it, it turns out that when becomes unsafe and the target scheduler, 
are kind of like the anti peanut butter cup. They're two great tastes that don't taste great together. Um, when when the when becomes unsafe interrupts target scheduler and then gives control back to target scheduler, things aren't in the same state that they were anymore, and so target scheduler would get confused. So we chose to solve that problem by getting completely out of target scheduler, putting the safety handling in a different container, and then letting loop control bring us back around. Um, but there are some things that you can check on, um, might not be as detailed as what you're talking about, like looking for specific types of weather conditions, um, but theoretically, a plugin could be written to support that. But probably not going to get it out of the box in that kind of detail. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to your um, your question about the the shutter there in a minute, and about handling errors. So now that we've exited the night loop, we come down to kind of the things that we do at the end of the night. And the first of those is this narrowband flats container. Just like for the broadband flats, we check a constant, in this case, get NB flats. And if that's true, we park the scope, we um, wait for nautical dawn, although actually we probably are already at nautical dawn. Um, and then we actually go get our flats. And again, this is timed so that it'll finish by civil dawn because the roof is open to the observatory at this point if, if we've had a good night of imaging and we don't want too much light in there to interfere with our flats. And then, excuse me, we get to our power off container. It's responsible for basically shutting down everything for the night. Again, we park the scope, probably already parked, but we are gonna do that at every opportunity. Uh, warm up the camera, disconnect from most of the equipment, we actually stay connected to the safety monitor and the weather um, so that if a human comes on and looks at things during the day, they can actually get current conditions. Uh, we have an external script that we call that just shuts down our external Windows programs like PHD and PWI3 and APCC, although APCC will shut itself down. We just run that again as a, a precaution in case it didn't. And then we turn off some power And then finally, we actually have to get to the next day. And that's a very specific thing in Nina land. Um, in Nina 3, the day begins at, at dawn, at sunrise. In Nina 2, the day begins at noon. So you have to do slightly different things depending on which version of Nina. This sequence is written for three, but uh, it could be, it'll work just as well for two. And the way we do that is uh, we just wait for actual sunrise, and then we delay for 10 minutes just to get past sunrise, although in reality, a few seconds would be fine, but we're going to be waiting for hours. So let's just get safely past sunrise. And then we wait for sunset. And then this, will ex this container will exit when we get to sunset. We loop around to the top and start the whole thing over again. Now, if this is Nina 2, then you just change this wait for time to actually wait for a specific time. Uh, you could wait for, say, 11.59 and then wait 10 minutes to get past uh, noon, and then you wait for sunset again. So here's our, our what our Discord notifications look like. And we use Discord to communicate among the team. We talk about what targets we want to get, any problems we're having, that sort of thing. But we also use Ground Station's HTTP request to send notification to Discord's web webhook. They're actually, in, if you're using Nina 2, there's a Discord alert plugin, which is great, but it's not yet been ported to Nina 3, so we have to use this workaround for now. One of the things that we miss from that Discord alert plugin is the ability to catch errors and send them to Discord. We can't do that with Ground Station's HTTP request. Um, Ground Station can send catch errors and send them to an alert like pushover, but it can't do it with HTTP. Um, and 
I don't know if, if Discord doesn't get uh, if Discord alert doesn't get ported to Nina three, maybe we can convince Dale, the uh, Ground Station author, to add that. Now we come to something that's uh, related to Terry's question, which is robustness. And for a sequence like this to work, everything basically has to work. Um, one of the things we do to try to kind of help the sequence to work since the cloud monitor is really very coarse in the kinds of uh, cloud coverage data it gives us it kind of goes up in increments of 25 percent um so it could say 50 percent but it's really like 30 percent so we, we chose 75 percent as our conditions for unsafe um in terms of it's probably going to be hard to image when there's that much cloud coverage um, we set our autofocus attempts to 10 and we set our plate solve attempts to 10 with two minute pauses to just try to give the sequence as much chance as it can to actually do the right thing and then those notifications they're not just nice they actually help us give give us some peace of mind that the sequence is actually running correctly uh, we don't have to go log into the system to check on it. We can look and see if the last, last notification looks reasonable. And um, if something does go wrong, we get at least some forensics about what the last thing we were doing was. Now, to Terry's thing about if an error happens, this is really a problem with ASCOM in general. ASCOM drivers do a terrible job about reporting what went wrong in general and so nina's approach is if a sequence instruction fails it just kind of shrugs and says oh well and goes on to the next instruction in our case we do that for most things except for power on and connect because if those fail we can't continue and so we'll abort the sequence in those cases uh, but we do have the number of retry attempts on them set to like five or ten or something like that. Um, in practice, they're not an issue. But if something like the the roof closure, the dome closure failed, um, you want to know. And so you can set the retry count to five or ten or a hundred even, but if something went wrong that Nina, you know, that isn't transient, then it's just going to continue failing. So having a notification that, uh, like ground stations push over, send push over on error, where it sends it to a, a notification directly to your phone, uh, and you can have that be an emergency alert, so it'll wake you up if need be. Uh, those can be useful things. Um, Terry, does that answer the, the kind of question that you had? Uh, yes, yeah, we've got a f another question about um, errors as well. The uh, one from Simon asking um, if Nina crashes, uh, hopefully I got this correct, and a hardware watchdog were to take over, is there a way to stop, say, a roll off from clobbering your telescope? Um, this is one reason why a dome is nice because you can close it at, at any time and it doesn't chop off your telescope but you could arrange a series of switches um, and have logic in your switching to check if your telescope has parked correctly before you shut your your uh, roll-off roof yeah uh, and uh, linda you have one of your partners who has a observ observatory that does just this i do yeah, yeah, I think I think it is. It's uh, what's his name? Um, I'll put up the link. I was watching it uh, uh, a YouTube schedule schedulers part one. He's in the UK. Oh, oh, Chris. Yeah, okay. Chris, Chris. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. He, uh, he he's got some relays to check if his telescope has actually arrived at the correct location before he shuts his roof. Otherwise, he'd have a bad failure. I, yeah. should, should I put that link up into the uh, stream? Yeah, sure. Um, Okay. The one product I'm familiar with, uh, Skyroof, does have those kinds of relays. Um, it's actually, I'm, I'm trying to find someone to build an observatory here in, in the Shenandoah Valley. 
and I can't get contractors to return telephone calls. If somebody knows how to get a contractor to return a telephone call, please let me know. But I want to build it so that the roof can close regardless of the position the telescope's in for just that reason. I don't want the roof either to be remain open because the telescope didn't park or kill the telescope because it didn't notice. Um, Mary, are, there any other questions? are there any other questions in the chat? Uh, not, not really. More just about upgrading and stuff like that and handling handling some of these errors. Okay, thank you. And this is something where it's good to uh, if you have if you get a friend you can talk to and try and get all the logic because you can you can actually address a lot of this through switches and logic. Yeah, I, I tend to have about three redundancies for every system on on, on my system, and uh, it I've been fortunate so far. I think, I think I've gone. Uh, almost three years that I was visiting the observatory and it just ticks over so you but there was a lot of planning but you can accomplish this it, it's not yeah, an easy thing but uh, Linda has been doing an excellent job from what I can say my, my congratulations this is a very good demonstration thanks um, now we're, we've kind of gone through the sequence but let's talk about the way we're using target scheduler and target scheduler as, as Tom presented um, uses projects, which are basically places where you define targets. And so we have four projects, high priority, normal priority, low southern targets, and then low priority. Our high priority projects, excuse me, are basically for things that we want to give every opportunity to run when they can, whenever they're viable. And so we give these a high priority and we give them a longer meridian window so they can get as much imaging time as possible. We'll take three hours on either side of the meridian. By convention, the team has decided that we're only going to have one of these active at any given time. And so something like the supernova in M101 might be a good candidate for something like this. Most of our projects go here in the normal priority uh, project. And here we have a smaller meridian window, just two hours on either side of the meridian. And we're trying to optimize our sky time to use the smallest amount of air that we can to look through. And so we might do several targets in a given night, but thankfully at SRO, we get a lot of clear nights. And so we're still confident we're going to get to them eventually. But some targets are too low and they won't work with that 30 degree minimum altitude in the normal project priority. So we have another project called Low Southern Targets, and it's theoretically allowed to go down to zero. In practice, we have a horizon file defined for the observatory that shows how low we can go at any position, and that will be the ultimate arbiter. We actually use that custom horizon on all of the projects, but this is the one where it really comes into play. And then our final project is for low priority targets. And we're not really concerned about when these finish. Um, we might put star clusters in here typically. And we're using moon avoidance with the plugin. So if our normal targets are maybe a little too close to the moon to get image, well, maybe some of our low priority targets might get some time at that point. Um, maybe not, it depends on how close they are to the moon. But um, Things that we don't want to interrupt other targets go here. And if those other targets can't be picked, then maybe these will get picked. So one of the things we do, we set our, our exposure plans for each target to basically cycle through each filter one at a time. All of the filters have moon avoidance configured. They've each each filters you know, we've got different numbers for broadband versus narrowband in terms of how close they're allowed to go to the moon, but they're all trying to stay fairly far away from the moon. And there's a bunch of parameter weights that you can give to projects, and we haven't really tried to optimize them yet, but so far Target Scheduler has done a reasonable job of picking things for us. The one thing we do need to be careful of, especially in that normal targets project, is that we don't load it up with too many targets that are in the same meridian window because we might not get to all of them. 
So that, that one's on us. Uh, but target scheduler, once we've put stuff in there, will decide which ones to pick on any given night. So nothing's perfect. Everything could be improved, right? Um, although we can get flats and darks automatically, they actually need to be manually moved to their proper folders uh, after the fact the next morning. But thankfully, both of these happen infrequently enough that it's not really an onerous task. And we have to actually remember to put that constant to true and then the next morning reset it to false when we've got things done. Or in the case of darks, maybe a few days later. In our case, neither the Texas Observatory rig or the SRO rig has a rotator. So our flats aren't a big deal. We can use a set of flats for weeks. Um, but if you have a rotator and you do need to get flats at every rotation, then things are maybe a little more problematic. Uh, Tom's been, uh, he's got better flat handling on target scheduler's roadmap, but for now, target scheduler and rotators may not be an optimal combination depending on how frequently you need to get flats. Basically, when a target completes, you don't know which flats you need to get in one of those target buckets or at the end of the night. So once there's a way to communicate that information uh, or have a, an instruction that'll handle that for you, that'd be a lot better. So once this presentation is done, this link will be live. Um, Molly, I can send that to you so you can put it in the uh, in the YouTube chat. I should have done that before. Uh, but you'll be able to grab the sequence from here if you want to look at it and maybe dissect it to use pieces in your own. Um, and I know some of you are saying, but I don't have an observatory. But really, this sequence is just a normal run one night sequence with some extra stuff around it to handle multiple nights. So you can delete the parts you don't need and still use the basic framework if you want a target scheduler based sequence that'll work even if you have to set up each night. One of our teammates, Chris Kage, a different Chris than what uh, Terry was talking about, um, actually uses target scheduler at home and he has to set up each night. Um, he doesn't have quite this much automation, but a basic sequence around the target scheduler is pretty simpler, simple to set up. And then these are the people that are on our team at SRO, uh, links to their Astro bin. Um, you can get to their, their images from SRO or to their imaging at home or other places. Um, and then if you're still awake, we can go look at some live demo if we have time. How are we doing on time, guys? Uh, we're doing pretty well. How long does your demo take? Oh, well, I can just kind of show you what's going on there live so you can see okay. what happens with live data. So let me hop over to SRO. And let me... So here's a live view of our telescope. You can see the roof is open and nothing's really happening yet. Um, if we look at where the sequence is, you can see it's waiting until, um, what is that, 1926 um, for something to happen. So, one of the nice things about Nina is it shows you if you have this pane open what's going on or if we jump over to the to the sequencer tab we can see where we are Let me just take a quick peek at something um so we can see what's what's happening in there so you can see here are the kinds of instructions that i talked about earlier and you can see down here we're waiting for another seven minutes and 15 seconds so one of the great things is that nina shows you what it's doing both here in terms of the immediate instruction and then over here in terms of of what's happening. Um, not a lot going on there yet. 
um, let's hop over here to target scheduler and you can see what it thinks it's going to do tonight. So if we come down here to the eighth and run a preview, and let me zoom the, in here. Uh, the print's kind of small. Yeah, zoom in if you could, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is the preview of the plan. Now the plan may not execute exactly like this because this doesn't take into account plate solving time, dithering time, or you know, in the worst case, if if safety stops happen. But um, we're going to start out doing this. It's going to show you what things it's going to do, and then it's going to come into here, and then here and to finish out the night. And so in an ideal world, it'll get through everything on this list. Um, if I come back up here, we can actually see, well, there's that M31 detail in M32. We can see that we're trying to get 50 and then 20, 20, 20, and then 32. And this is what we've actually done. So we really just have some green and some H alpha left to get there. And then that target will be complete. If we look over at the helix, we've still got, uh, we've got, still got about, you know, 40% um, of our uh, subs to still get. So we can see what target scheduler has done. The other thing that we can do is come down here and we can see what ran last night. So these are the things that happened. Um, in this case, the image grader accepted all of the uh, sub exposures, but if it didn't, this would say failed and then it would tell you why. It doesn't actually delete the sub, but it doesn't increment the accepted count if it fails. Um, and we can go in here. I guess we need to pick a target first. And so we can see everything that happened for the helix there last night. Uh, we can look at a particular project or to target there and see what happened. So target scheduler gives you some pretty good visibility into what's happened. Turn all that off. And you can look back historically over time as well to see what happened. Um, let me hop over to Texas. Ah. And Texas, the roof is still closed. And we're in a safety condition. So you can see, might be easier to see over here, the resolution is lower at Texas. Um, so here, we're in that wait until safe period. Um, and here I put a little wait for time span to delay 300 seconds if we get in here, because the weather monitor at uh, Texas can sometimes uh, give us a little bit of, uh, I'm safe, I'm unsafe, I'm safe, I'm unsafe, if the cloud cover hovers right around our threshold value. So we're gonna stay in here at least five minutes so that we don't just slew them out back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for no reason. Um, and so there's nothing really going on there, but we can see what it's going to do for the night. Yeah, you're on the eighth. And so it's going to be spending some time on the Tulip Nebula, Barnard 5, and Sharpless 261. Um, and if we wanted to see what it's going to be doing, say, in two weeks, 
Now, of course, this won't take into account the subs that will have been gotten between now and then. But if we had, say, two weeks of rainy weather out there and we wanted to do something, then it would be trying to do this. And that's based on uh, probably moon avoidance. Um, one of the nice things is you can click view details here. And this is another eye test. But you can see why targets get picked or not picked. Uh, so it can be, it can really help you in understanding those weighting parameters and how you might want to use them. Uh, so that pretty much, not, not a lot happening here at either observatory right now. Well, I got a couple of questions, Linda. Yeah, sure. How do you pick up your data or how does your team pick up the data? Oh, I meant to mention that. Um, we use a program called SyncThing. And SyncThing is an open source file synchronization package. And so you define a folder and then a bunch of remote devices. And as each sub comes in, we actually, they synchronize to all of us automatically. And so when we wake up in the morning, we have a night's worth of data, if data was collected, waiting for us. And how do you decide how much data you should collect before you've actually looked at it? Um, so we, we aspirationally say we're going to generally aim for about 24 hours per target. And we might adjust that up or down depending on if it's a super bright target. Oh, something's happening here. Oh, it just parked itself. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we have a question from Bob. Can the scheduler variables be used to break out of the parallel container? No. Okay. That's an easy one. Okay. Um, th those variables that we're using are part of the sequencer power-ups. Um, and I'm guessing he wants to use them for some sort of synchronization to say when things happen. Um, and so far as I know that there's no way to do that. We have any more questions, Terry? No, I couldn't get the be. link to work. Um, it takes me to your website, but oops, that page can't be found. Oh, I, yeah. let me, uh, I, as soon as we're done here, I'll make that active. Uh, okay. I, I just yeah. need to publish the web page. Okay. I tried it as well. Go ahead I and put the link in the chat then. Yeah. That, that looks to be it for questions. I don't see any more. They're just talking about plugins and various plugins that people use for uh, a pushover um, ground station and how they act on certain things. But one of the things I love about Nina is how many plugins just suddenly, uh, excuse me, suddenly appeared when uh, Nina introduced its plugin modules. And I mean, really, really useful things. Ground Station is awesome. Uh, sequencer power ups is just, it's very elegant. And, and then there's Target Scheduler itself, which turns Nina into something that, you know, just a few years ago, you would have had to spend quite a bit of money to get similar functionality. And it pretty much works. It's not perfect, you know, no piece of software is, but it's very, very usable. Uh, you can, if you're done with your presentation, you can stop presenting. Sure thing. If I can get back to there. Can you tell us uh, what kind of equipment you have on both setups? I thought you had a 1600 AP mount and yeah, uh, and Molly, that link should be active now. Um, so in in SRO, it's an AP1600. Uh, the owner actually just upgraded it to put absolute encoders on it. Um, the telescope's a plane wave CDK14. The camera is an FLI uh, ML16803. Um, Astrodon filters. And uh, let's see, 
they just again he, he also just put the flat panel up there which makes my life a lot simpler and um at texas it's a an astrophysics 1100 again with absolute encoders the telescope's a Cerevolo 300 millimeter astrograph um, and an FLI ML 16200 camera, again with Astrodon filters. Do you ever sync up your, your targets to get the wide field versus the longer focal length? Yeah, uh, the club, one of the clubs that I belong to, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, we, we're kind of on our third annual collaboration process, project. and um, so in this year, we're doing Lowers Nebula, Sharpless 261 that you saw there at the end of the Texas run. And so we're, um, that's one case where, where I've actually done that. We, we did that a couple of years ago on the tadpoles and uh, hopefully we'll get to do it again this year. So it's kind of fun seeing the different fields of view there so on, on those collaborations. Well, I was thinking between your two setups, the 300 and the 14 inch. Yeah, the 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 300 has got a, a somewhat wider field of view for sure. It's image scale is a little bit coarser. It's like 0. 0.83, I think, versus 0. 0.73, something oh, so, like that. Oh, so they're pretty close in in terms of image scale, but the the Texas scope has a bigger field of view. Mm -hmm. Not a hugely bigger, but at, at home, I get a somewhat bigger field of view and kind of split the difference in image scale. So that's kind of fun, too. Uh, which building are you in at the SRO? Uh, I think it's building nine. I think that's the right build, building number. Never been there myself, so I'm working off of memory there. Yeah, I know I've been out there for nine years, and then I've been there once. <laughs> But I, I see you have cameras there, so I like to look at the pictures from the cameras to see see the equipment. It's it's it really goes a long way toward peace of mind to knowing that the telescope is pointing There's, where the, you think it's pointing. The telescope is parked. <laughs> um, uh, what do you do if you have power failures? Can you get back up, or do you have to log in? Um. I haven't experienced a power failure at either observatory, um, but I, I, my suspicion is we'd have to log in and you know fix, get things started back up again. If I, I, I know you, both of them have backup power, but you know assuming that didn't last. Um, the other thing is if we have to do an update to a plug-in or to Nina itself, that requires restarting things. So we have to interrupt things manually then. Harry, any more questions we got a field from YouTube? No, that looks pretty much it. So, so Linda, do you, you leave the software running or the equipment running 24-7? The equipment's not running 24-7, but the software is. The so. software is. Do you um, do a, a daily reboot on your PC or just let it run? No, it just runs. Um, and the only time it has to reboot is if Windows tells us it has to reboot. We've been running for at least a couple weeks since, well, maybe a week since we've done the last update to a plugin. So at least a week. So um, we've run as long as two or three weeks before an update forced us to do something. You know, you, then we have the, the sure. random Windows reboot on its own. Yes. That, that we all hate. Yeah. I like to kill that function. Do you? Uh, I haven't had that happen while I have open and running apps because Windows is good at detecting that you have stuff running and not rebooting during that time. <laughs> I, I think I've told Windows not to, to reboot on me or at least to define the window when it's allowed to, but um, it's always a fear. If there isn't out of, there's a place where you can set that up. Yeah. So your, your work hours are nighttime. Yeah. <laughs> not daytime. Do you image your PC? You just, I'm, I'm sorry. You, what was uh, do you image your PC? You, you've got it all um, up and running really nice. It'd be nice to have a, a rollback in case something falls. Yeah, that that would be a great idea. And currently we don't. Um, uh, but it would be a good thing to have. 
there, it saves a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I could recreate what's there pretty easily. Um, we've got things like the sequence are backed up offsite in our sync directory. Um, and there's some Nina configuration that I could do the same thing with. Uh, but in terms of reinstalling everything, that would be a little bit of a pain. If you wanted to move this to another computer, do you just back up the Nina directory only, or do you have to go into the app area and down and get stuff? From There's there? two things that you'd want to back up. One is the Nina uh, subdirectory in your documents directory because that's probably where you've got your sequences, and then the other is in um, me. There's an app data directory that all applications can store their data in. Nina's got a directory in there and you want to grab that. And, and, uh, and that's, I, your, that's your database for your sequences, is it? Yeah, that's, that's Nina's configuration information. Target scheduler puts its database there. All the plugins have their configuration there, that sort all of thing. All the profiles, uh, yeah. like uh, for yeah. your, which drivers you're using, your filter offsets and stuff, those are exactly. in the data folder. Yeah. Okay. So you could write a script to uh, to back that up occasionally. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Uh, if that's all, thank you very much. Great presentation. Not I'm not a Nina user, but I can I can certainly see that if all of a sudden Voyager went south on me, I'd have someplace nice to go. Well, a similar well, like Eric Griffiths is well, you, you can. You're muted. Molly, but you can stay muted if you want. I mean, you don't. No, I was. Uh, I was just mouthing, like <laughs> cheering for Nina. <laughs> I know. No, no. It seems like Nina and Voyager are really the two modern systems now that you know can do automation, as opposed to a couple others who's who I won't mention. Yeah. Well, anyway, great program, but I, I'm a big fan of Nina's UI. And not only that, but you have a very nice user base and a lot of people that contribute to it. Yeah, you're not relying on one or two individuals uh, to write the software yeah, or to give whole, support. There's a whole Discord server for Nina. Yeah, uh, I think that's about all. I do have one announcement of a future program. We were talking about it earlier. Uh, we have a good audience. You actually kept your audience all through the whole presentation. Thank you, audience. Um, you, thank you, audience. And audience, I have an announcement for you. I made a suggestion that we have a show of epic fails in astrophotography. And if that doesn't bring a smile to your face, then you're not listening. And the way we thought about doing it is we would have our own stories and they would be stories. And then we'd have contributions from the people online, you guys out there in YouTube land, and you'd submit it and we'd find a way to present it. Uh, what what was the program? What was the storytelling program that I keep forgetting the name of? Molly, help Moth me. Radio please. Hour. Yes, the Moth. So it'd be like mini Moth Radio Hours where we tell it, like the time my wife whacked her head on the on the weight bar in my mount and knocked herself half silly. It doesn't sound funny, but it was kind of funny once the pain, you know, subsided. So I would. We're going to have an announcement. We'll tell you a little, little bit more about it. We'll put it on our schedule, and we hope a lot of people will contribute to it. And we'll either read the stories, or maybe there'll be recordings, or we'll figure out a way to present it. Epic fails in astrophotography. Uh, if anyone else has anything, you know, now's the time to speak. Otherwise, who's ever in charge of the program, Patrick, you can take us out. And everyone's welcome to hang out, as we usually do. Linda, Terry. Not you, Terry. You, Terry. <laughs> All right, everyone. Good night. Uh, we won't Good night. see you next week. We'll see you the week after. Yeah.